Hi everybody, Chef AJ here for episode 41 of Weight Loss Wednesday. Who knew even that we'd be going on this long? I thought I've said everything I could possibly say, but I guess not. And actually I'm going to demonstrate a recipe today. So once I know that you can hear me and see me, we'll get started. We have five people, but no one's yeah, we just we like because of that one time we're six minutes. It's sort of right. like the Nixon tapes, the Watergate tapes. I forget how many <laughs> minutes we're missing that uh, we decided to always ask for. Pat says, see in here. Okay. Okay, here we go. So officially, I welcome you. Hi, everybody. I'm Chef AJ, and welcome to episode 41 of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm the creator of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, and this is where I answer your questions about healthy, permanent and sustainable weight loss. And the best way to submit a question is through my website, www.eatunprocessed.com. So we'll get started with the first question. And once you hear the first question, you'll know why we're in the kitchen today. So the first question is from Gunther. He said, I saw your Weight Loss Wednesday, episode 39, where you use the Instant Pot and Air Fryer. Which Instant Pot and Air Fryer do you recommend using? That episode has motivated me to cook the veggies in the Instant Pot and get the vegetable broth and to make french fries in the air fryer. Yeah, thank you, Gunther. I remember meeting you at True North and I'm gonna be back there next week if you're available. I'll be there lecturing August 20th through 23rd and I'll be there again December 23rd to January 2nd if you'd like to join me for the most festive time of year there, the holiday cooking extravaganza. So I'm not gonna be showing the Instant Pot today, but I will answer your question in general, whenever you guys ask me a culinary question about equipment, my answer is pretty much always the best one that you can afford and the biggest one that you can afford. So with the Instant Pot, I have the three quart, the little baby iPod, which is back there, and I also have the eight quart, and I have two in between, the six quarts. That's because I teach cooking classes, and as a matter of fact, I just did last week my first hands-on all Instant Pot cooking class with five Instant Pots. It was sold out very quickly, so we're repeating it. September 15th, I believe, is the date at the Boulevard Kitchen. It's a culinary school in Sherman Oaks on Ventura Boulevard. So if you're interested in the hands-on Instant Pot class, be sure you're either on my mailing list or check the website of Boulevard Kitchen. And it's great to make broth with it, Gunther, because it's free and you don't have to worry about packaging. Now, as far as the air fryer, we're gonna demonstrate a recipe today because as Eden's here, Gonna, she's gonna stay, I'm inviting her to stay for dinner. And I figured why not just use Weight Loss Wednesdays as an excuse to make dinner for us because I posted a photo last week of a impromptu recipe that I threw together. And people are driving me crazy, not, not driving me crazy, but people keep saying, what's the recipe, what's the recipe? And the truth is, there really isn't a recipe because unless you buy my cookbook on processed or get one of my webinars, <coughs> I really don't cook with recipes. If I'm baking, which I don't even do anymore, yes, I'll bake with recipes, but I cook in a very improvisational style. I just throw together whatever's ready. And when you don't eat sugar and oil and salt and flour, it's really easy because everything tastes good. So let me just show you how I do things in the air fryer. This, you guys asked me what kind I use. Well, I use the kind that was a present. This is the Cook's Essential QVC, and it's the 5.8 quart. Basket's this big. I do not recommend you get the smaller one. Nobody I know has been happy with the 3.2 quart. You could cook one potato. You, this isn't even big enough for the family. This only makes enough food for me, which is why I had to pre-make a bunch of food. But there's very few parts. Here's the basket with the holes. You don't want to obstruct the holes with parchment paper or anything like that. It, that way you can shake it in the middle. So there's very few pieces. I take this with me when I travel. But if I had to buy one myself, I wouldn't buy this one. Not because it's not good, it is good. It's just too small. I was just in Baltimore speaking at the PCRM IC and M conference and Sharon McRae had the Breville Smart Oven. So if you're asking me what I would get, that's what I would get. Yeah, it's $399. I'm told that if you get a credit card at Williams-Sonoma, they take 25% off. You don't have to pay for the credit card. If you get it at Bed Bath & Beyond, 25% off. Takes it down to $299. But it's big enough to fit multiple trays. At least three, I believe, maybe four. And it would take up about this much room on my counter. So I am going to get one. I'm just very busy right now finishing up my book. But I will get one and use this one just for travel. So, one of the things that you want to do with your air fryer, obviously, like any other piece of equipment, is you plug it in. So every air fryer is a bit different. Not all of them have the preheat setting. This one does. Ooh, I must have been doing something before to have that 
on there. So why did that do that? It's, it's really smart. I, I was cooking earlier. It must have remembered the setting that I was on. Even though I unplugged it, that's very strange. See, there is a benefit to reading books that go with things, and I'm one of these people that never does. Okay, there we go. So when you plug it in, a little blue light appears, at least in this one. And the, I've only used this one in the Go Wise, which is the one I bought Mary McDougal for her birthday. There's a bunch of buttons, don't know what they're for, didn't read the book, but there's a little circle button like the home button, like on your iPhone or smartphone. You just push that. The default is 370. You push it again, it's 15 minutes. Now people say, well, how long did you cook it? I just cook everything for 20 minutes at 400 and hope it turns out, it seems to. So to raise the temperature, right now I'm, I'm preheating. So I press the P button, and then at three minutes it's gonna preheat. And then preheating is at 400, and then I'm gonna cook the things that I cook. Now, as part of our dinner, we're going to have this delicious, organic, non-GMO sweet corn. And it's at room temperature now. It tastes fine at room temperature, but I might put it in for a minute just to heat it up a little bit. I made some Japanese eggplant circles. Eggplant's not one of my favorite vegetables because it always tends to be too mushy, but if you use the Japanese or the Chinese, you can make these wonderful little circles. They're delicious in the air fryer. You don't need any oil in the air fryer, no salt, no matter what it says, you don't need any. And we're gonna shoot this with some balsamic vinegar before we eat it. And so what I'm gonna be making today is stuffed portobello mushrooms. And you can stuff anything. You can stuff a bell pepper, you can stuff a potato or a sweet potato for twice baked sweet potatoes. You can stuff a jalapeno pepper, which is delicious. Shada brought some to our house, jalapeno poppers. The filling was delicious. The jalapeno was so hot, most people couldn't eat it. So I had, after my cooking class last week, I had two portobellos left over. And I had a cooked russet potato in my fridge because I always have potatoes in my fridge cooked, my batch cooked. I'm like, what am I gonna do with this? So I made up this recipe. Now, what I did is I, I cooked my mushrooms in the air fryer a little bit in advance, and I do that because there's gonna be some shrinkage, and I wanna know what the surface area is for my mashed potatoes. How long you do that is up to you. You can see that the longer I cook it, the smaller the mushroom got. This I did for about 15 minutes, this I did for about eight minutes. The reason I like it longer is because it's gonna make it smaller so I can fit more in the air fryer and I want more potato than mushroom because believe it or not, I'm not a mushroom fan, but for some reason in the air fryer, I like mushrooms and that way I can fit more in. But there's no right or wrong answer. You could even not cook it first. You could just put it in like that, but it's gonna get more of a kind of a chewy, meaty texture that I like better if you cook it a little bit in advance. So I don't have any portobellos to show you, but what you do is you take out the stem and with a spoon, you just scrape out the gills. And this will not go to waste, Gunther. This will go in my scrap bag for when it's time for me to make broth again, or I can just throw it in a salad, something like that. Before we go on with the recipe, this was a gift from one of you. If you could please tell me, first of all, who you are so I can thank you, and second of all, what it is. It came to my P.O. box, there was no card, I don't know what it is. I'm guessing it's either for the air fryer or the Instant Pot. So thank you so much. Please tell me who you are and what it is. All right. So, you know, you don't have to preheat. Not every air fryer has a preheat. And a lot of people say to me, well, can't I just use my oven for air frying? I have a convection oven. I don't know. But I will tell you this. I live in the hottest part of, one of the hottest parts of Southern California, the San Fernando Valley. And when I turn on my oven, my whole apartment is sweltering. When I turn on my air fryer, nothing just a little bit of heat coming out the back. So that's why I prefer air frying. So this will be done in just a second, and we are going to get on with the mushrooms, which is going to be tonight's dinner, and I'm gonna show you how I did it. All right, so that means it is preheated, perfect. Okay, so now, believe it or not, I'm not a, the best mashed potato maker in the world. I rarely make them. It's always somebody else like Kenny makes them at the holidays. We had company last night for dinner. We did our stuffed potato meal, the Mexican stuffed potato, the McCrae's, the whole family came over. So we had a lot of potatoes that my husband roasted in the oven that were left over. So I'm just gonna include a few of the sweet potatoes because what the heck, I didn't do this with the original recipe. The original recipe actually was russets, but these are Yukon Golds and I peeled them. The easiest time to peel a potato is when it's hot. And you could probably cook these in the Instant Pot or microwave them too. Actually, when I made this recipe the first time, the potatoes were microwaved. I don't have a potato masher. Uh, just my hands. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna put them in the food processor fitted with the S blade. Now when I first made this recipe, normally I would have put non-dairy milk in instead of water, 
but I didn't have any that day. So I'm just gonna use a little bit of water, just enough water to get it to be creamy. want to get it creamy because these are mashed potatoes and if you have a potato masher I would recommend it probably the easiest time to mash potatoes is when they're cooked right after they're cooked but I didn't know I was going to do this so I'm just going to put in a little bit more and it's okay if I put in too much I really never measure because I'll just add more potato if it's too mushy there we go spices now. The spices that I added, I didn't measure. I just added what I like. And these still have to go a little bit longer. I'm sorry about the noise and that it's taken so long. But if mashed potatoes aren't creamy, what good are they? So it just needs a little bit more smushing. But I may as well ask, add the spices now. I literally took some garlic powder. I did not measure. I just kind of went boom, 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 boom. I took some onion powder. I did the same thing. Boom, 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 boom. You don't even have to add any seasoning. I took my favorite salt-free seasoning, Benson's Table Tasty, and I added a nice, generous serving. You, if you use nutritional yeast, you can add it here. I know it's a little controversial, so I'm not adding it. But one of the things I'm adding now that I didn't add before, but I thought it would be good, was a little bit of dried parsley, because I think it would make it look pretty. And it looks like it needs just a little bit more water to blend. And that's going to be my mashed potato portion. And again, plant milk would be great. I just didn't have it. processor it's an old is a good one it's an oldie but a goodie an oldie but a goodie it is the oster it only cost $89 at Walmart but I want them really really creamy because that's what we like about mashed potatoes I love that I'm using orange in here this time instead of just the uh, organic Yukon gold the other thing that you could do is put some finely chopped kale in here that would be fantastic even if it wasn't cooked that would be really amazing we're just gonna do one more pass guys have to watch me just make mashed potatoes and not get to your questions. So having a different tool would have made them even creamier, but that's okay. A few chunks will be okay. So I've got my mashed potatoes and I normally would let it go a little bit longer to get them as oh, get them as creamy as possible like we would on Thanksgiving, but that's okay. We're going to just go with it and I'm going to get dirty. I'm going to use my hands. I'm going to put down my mushrooms and you could do this with potatoes you could stuff the potatoes you don't have to stuff the potatoes at all and so what I'm gonna do oh, look at that I want it as big and as high as I can because that's the best part look at that the potato part oh boy nothing like fluffy potatoes and there's not a lot of sweet potato in here it really won't make it sweet potato tasting it just will give it just a pretty nice color lots of nutrients look at that oh baby that's what Emerald says, oh baby. So this is gonna be dinner tonight. Now portobello mushrooms are expensive. I bought these at Trader Joe's, they were $1.50 each. That's like $9. Wow. 
So three dollars a person now. Costco, they're a lot cheaper. So this isn't a, a, you know cheap to make this for a crowd. But you can stuff. You certainly could do the same filling in jalapenos. I would recommend you take out the seeds though because they're just it's just could be too spicy. You know there you could have argued I should have left them uh, uncooked because then I would have had a bigger area. So here we go. One of the things I'm going to try with this leftover after the show is over is, is just roll these mashed potatoes into a ball and just try to air fry them themselves. So there we go. Do you want to hold one close up to the camera yeah, when you're I done? Yeah, I just got to get more of the filling in. I want to show you guys a great way to get the filling, get everything out of your thing. These look, these already look amazing. I mean, you could actually eat this now. There's no reason you, I mean, just what the air fryer does is it makes it twice baked. It makes it crunchy on the outside and creamy on the inside like those restaurant stuffed baked potatoes. So I'm making these as full as I can because I want to be able to eat really potatoes. Now let me show you how you get the schmutz. It's not schmutz, it's mashed potatoes. So you got all this stuff stuck here. So how do you get it out? What you do is you put it back on the base, put your food processor on, really quickly push it just for a second, and now all that stuff is off the blades. So look at that. That's a lot of mashed potatoes. So I'm going to play with this later and see what I can make out of it. In the meantime, I want to get these in the air fryer and I want to get to your questions. So I don't know how many I'm going to be able to cook at one time in here. This is why if I am going to get the Breville because I can't do anything in here when I have a company. I can barely do anything for me and Charles. So I'm going to do the biggest ones first. Do you want to hold one yeah, up? Sorry about that. That's okay. So I'm going to put these in here. And it looks like I might be able to get, well, maybe I'll be able to get four in there. Maybe I'll be able to get five. Okay, one, two, three. Yeah, I don't want to over, that's the thing. When people say their recipes don't come out, they often overstuff it. We'll cook the other two later. So here we go. We've got four in here now. And now I'm going to start the air fryer. It might get a little noisy. So I'm going to push my home button, push it again. That means it's 370 for 15 minutes. I like to raise everything up to 400 so it will be done quicker. And as far as time, well, I know it's going to take at least 20 minutes, so I'm going to put it on 20 minutes and we can look at it. All right, sorry it took so long, guys. So Eden, any questions for me today? Um, people are asking, would a Vitamix would a Vitamix work instead of a food processor? Uh, for mashed potatoes, gosh, I don't, I don't know. My, 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 the thing is, is I think you need to use m more liquid in a Vitamix than in a food processor. Look, that's not necessarily the best way to mash potatoes. The best way to mash potatoes is to cook them in the instant pot or on the stove, and while they're still all hot and steamy, take take a blender. I, these, these had been refrigerated overnight; they had gotten hard again. You could try it, but I, I don't think Vitamixes are. I think Vitamixes are great for sorbets. And, and ice, you know, ice cream type things and smoothies, but I, I prefer a food processor because you have a bigger surface area. More quickly, so, all right. Okay, so plant-based mama says hello. She thanks you for all that you do. She has a question about dehydrated foods, onions in particular. She likes to snack on them um, and is wondering if, so she doesn't add oil, salt, or sugar. Good. But she is, just wants your thoughts and opinions on snacking on dehydrated onions. Well, so my thought and opinion on snacking in general or on dehydrated onions in particular, because I'm not a fan of snacking. You know, I think that if, you, if you're snacking, then you're eating because of emotional reasons and not hunger, or you didn't eat enough at the last minute, so meal. So I'm not a fan of snacking. And when Dr. Furman lectures, he gave this lecture in... Las Vegas about how you want to stay longer in I believe it's called the catabolic phase and that you don't want to be eating all day every second of the day. You want to eat meals, one, two, or three, whatever that is, but that, there's, that you don't want to be eating all day. You need to have the rest in between. So my question to you is, well, why are you snacking? Because you say you need to snack. Why do you need to snack in general? And why do you need to snack on crunchy stuff in specific? Because to me, that sounds a lot like emotional eating. Because when you're really hungry, any food, even eggplant, will satisfy your hunger. When you have to have particular foods or textures, that's always emotional eating. So, you know, most people will eat more of dehydrated foods or dried foods because 
water's taken out. And what helps you feel full, especially if you want to feel full on fewer calories, is making sure everything you eat has the fiber and the water intact. So I think dehydrated onions are great as a, as a, as a condiment on top of soup, on top of salads like croutons, but I don't think you should be snacking on dehydrated fruits or vegetables or all day. I mean, unless you're camping or, or hiking and you know you need the calories. So I'm just not a fan of snacking. I'm not a fan of dehydrating, except for under tr circumstances where you travel. Like when I travel and I can't get enough calories and I can't get enough fresh food, then I think it's great. But again, I don't know about your history with weight and eating, if you're trying to lose weight, gain weight, maintain weight. I don't think it's the end of the world, I mean, eating a crunchy vegetable, but when you say you need to snack, and you need to snack on a specific type of crunchy food, that I don't know why anybody needs to snack. Eat enough at meals, be satisfied, and then, then don't eat between meals. That's the best thing for your health and, and also for weight loss. So sorry to burst your bubble, but not a fan of snacking, not a fan of dehydrating, of the exceptions, of course, you know, kids maybe you're trying to get more calories in them you're traveling you're shipping things so uh, there's a company that i saw at the spokane veg fest that has everything dehydrated or maybe dried I'm, I'm, maybe it's freeze dried they get confused between the difference between freeze dried and dehydrating this is a dehydrator freeze drying i think is different they had everything from butternut squash to kale so these things could be great in cooking reconstituting especially like I know we have people in ultimate weight loss they're in the military so these could be like life-saving because they can't get vegetables but if you can get vegetables and you can get fresh vegetables eat fresh vegetables don't eat dehydrated vegetables and don't snack eat your meals be satisfied Jennifer asked about intermittent fasting mm -hmm. um, she's wondering if any liquid breaks that fast she's assuming water is okay yeah. but what about lemon water herbal tea etc yeah that's a that's a great question Jennifer because I thought that as long as you weren't eating you were intermittent fasting and David Goldman the wonderful dietitian at True North who I interviewed you can find the interview on my YouTube page chef AJ which by the way I'd love it if you'd subscribe and I'd love it if you'd share these videos right now or even afterwards on YouTube he said that because I'm drinking in the morning, I'm drinking pot liquor when I wake up to warm up when I'm walking Bailey and I'm drinking hibiscus tea on the bike, he says technically I'm not really intermittent fasting. It's not hurting me, but true intermittent fasting is no food and just pure water. You know, Dr. Chilla Vares, who's one of the wonderful doctors at True North, who I'll be interviewing soon, when she gives her lecture on fasting, she says even when, when patients put even a squeeze of lemon in, the, the fast is, they, that's not fasting because even that small, small amount of carbohydrate from that tiny bit of squeeze of lemon juice will take them out of, I guess, is it ketosis or whatever they need to be in to fast. So my understanding is that it's only water and that if you have anything else, you are breaking the fast, whether it's an intermittent fast or it's a water fast. Colleen asks if it is ever okay to use things like olives, pickles, or jalapenos. Yeah, so okay is a funny word because okay for what and okay for who. And remember that this Ultimate Weight Loss Program is not a court-ordered program. I wish it were for some people, but it, it, whatever you want to do is okay by me. I mean, you know, if you're a private client and we've set goals together, and you know, then that might be different. So let's take them one at a time, or let's take two and then one. So jalapenos and pickles generally have salt in them. Uh, well, actually all three have salt, but jalapenos and pickles are not high fat foods. So you can have pickles and jalapenos without salt. You can get them raw. You can make them without salt. I don't have a recipe, but I know Chef Francis Bravo at True North makes SOS free pickles and jalapenos you can use raw. But if you buy them in a jar at the store, they are going to have salt. I've never seen salt free pickles or jalapenos at the store without salt. Now you can soak them overnight it's gonna get rid of some of the salt, but not all of the salt. So it's really gonna depend on what your goals are and how salt sensitive you are. You know, I interviewed Dr. Roseanne Alviera today, and one of the things that she said is that um, when you eat salt, you, when one, not necessarily you, Kali, but when, when a person eats salt, they eat more fat indirectly. And I wanted to know what she meant by that because I've heard from my clients that when they eat salt, they generally eat more than they intended. They tend to overeat and they especially tend to crave sugar. And she sent me this study. Salt promotes passive overconsumption of dietary fat in humans. And she said that the study showed that salt seems to override fat-mediated satiation. In individuals who are sensitive to the taste of fat, 
which may lead to passive overconsumption of fat. And she said, generally speaking, individuals who are sensitive to the taste of fat will act naturally eat less fat. That's because the amount of fat in the food will lead to satiation quicker, and the individual will end up eating less fat. But she said this was not statistically significant. In, this was statistically statistically significant in women, but not men. In this particular study, she said women tended to eat 15% less fat by weight of a high fat meal compared to a low fat meal, which indicates they may be more sensitive to the taste of fat. But she says the biggest find of the study was that this fat mediated satiation that would allow individuals, especially women, sensitive to the taste of fat to naturally eat less fat occurs only when salt is low. When salt content is high, the fat mediated satiation is blunted. And she went into more detail on the interview. So again, what are your goals? Are you overweight? Are you trying to lose weight? You know, these things in the scheme of things, these things are not horrible, but depending on how sensitive you are, they may cause you to overeat. I know that when I eat any salt, I just eat more. It doesn't affect my weight, but my wedding ring doesn't go down and it's uncomfortable because it, it's too tight. So it just really depends how sensitive you are to the effects of salt, what your goals are. People I've worked with, when they eat salt, they eat more food and they have more cravings. So it really depends. Now, with olives, interestingly, olives are fat and salt. That's why people like it. People like sugar, fat, and salt. Sugar is addictive, fat's addictive, salt's addictive in all its forms. Sugar, sugar, oils, oils, salt, salt, flour, flour. Yes, some may be ostensibly slightly healthier, but because something is less bad doesn't make it good. I call them the evil trinity, sugar, oil, salt. I wanted to put flour in, but then I would kind of call it the evil square. That didn't really sound that good. You can get olives without salt. I've only seen them online, but I don't know how they taste. And my guess is they probably don't taste very good because what people like about olives is they get a nice bite of fat and salt. And you know, if somebody wants to put six olives on their salad or a few jalapenos that are jarred with salt on their Mexican stuffed potato, that's fine if, if you can handle it. I know for me, the minute there's any fat and salt in the food, my, my brain is like, where's more fat, where's more salt? I was just at the PCRM conference and they had a lot of no oil dishes and I had this quinoa broccoli dish and it had some toasted pine nuts in it. You know, when you take raw nuts, you'll eat a certain amount. When you toast them, you eat more, and when you toast them and salt them, roast them and salt them, you eat way more. So I went last so that I wouldn't be annoying to people to look for, try to get no pine nuts. And even then, I could tell that in a couple of bites I had pine nuts, and those were the best bites. And I was like, wow, this is good. So my brain, my body might be slender, but my brain is still a food addict, so I have to watch these things. So it's really going to be up to you. So okay, okay for who? Okay under what circumstances? Somebody's got a gun to your head, you're traveling. you know. My feeling, Colleen, is when in doubt, leave it out. Sugar, oil, salt aren't foods. They don't exist in nature in any concentrated forms. Throughout most of human history, our ancestors didn't eat them. I mean, there are populations today that still don't eat salt. I can't remember if it's the Yonamama Indians or the Tarahumara that Dr. Joel Kahn and Dr. Caldwell Esselstyn talk about, but they eat no salt. They have the lowest blood pressures. They run more miles a day than anybody else. They're so healthy. You know, you don't need it. If you don't have it, it, you know, it does take a while for the food to taste good without salt, it, sometimes 30 days, and then when you go back and have it, you're sucked right back in the pleasure trap, and then you want it all the time. Same thing, you know, that little bit of fat in the olive could be enough for you to then want more high-fat food all the time. You know, Dr. Esselstyn counsels his patients to go no added fat because it takes some time for that fat receptor to get down-regulated, and every time you add these foods, these chemicals, that, that fool the brain satiety mechanisms, stimulate overeating, I think it just can too easily suck you back in the pleasure trap if you're somebody that's overweight wanting to lose weight and or if you're a food addict. So I vote no. Um, Colleen also wants to know if you have a ballpark estimate as to when the next mastery class will be for the people in UWL. Right. Where does one need to be in within the UWL yeah. program to participate in that. Okay, and before we answer that question, I'm just gonna, it's been 10 minutes. Oh, oh that smells god. so good, it everyone. smells so good. So oh what my I'm god. gonna do is I am going to just move it around on the bottom just to make sure it doesn't get stuck. Just, and it's not gonna get stuck. Oh my god, these, these, and you know what guys? Having that little bit of orange from the sweet potato in there made it kind of look cheesy, even though there's no cheese. I mean, we could totally eat these now. And but what I'm going to do is I might actually have room for the other two now. When I smushed it in, it got these got a little separated. Let me let me just. Oh, if you
you guys could smell these. You gotta be really careful. This is so hot and I often burn myself on these. I have to get a better glove. I'm actually not wearing any glove now. But what is so extraordinary about these is these remind me of like those cheesy potatoes like from the restaurant. So I moved it around and you can see that it's starting oh, to... I might have to scooch back a little. Sorry, there we go. And I mean, we could eat these now, but I like them really crisp. So I'll put them back in for another nine or 10 minutes and then I'm going to cook the other ones. So Colleen, we're going to announce the next mastery program. The mastery program is a small, small intimate group coaching program for people that are already in ultimate weight loss. You can't join it unless you know the basics. And we're gonna announce that at the Vegas conference. And my guess is it's going to sell out because we're gonna offer it to the people there first as a courtesy for coming. And then if there's any spots left, then we'll put it on our website and make an announcement. It looks like we're going to run it from October 1st to January 2nd, the time of year when people have the most struggles, that holiday season. And then we'll probably run another one in January. So the prerequisites are just to be in UWL, but I think if you have the basics, you're going to do better. You do not have to be perfect. We have people that come to Mastery that have just joined UWL. We have people like Shada that keep joining because they want to stay at the Mastery level. But I would say that as long as you're willing to do the program as designed, it doesn't mean that you aren't struggling. But if you come to the mastery saying, well, I don't, I'm not going to eat vegetables for breakfast, that's probably not the right attitude. That's probably not the right program for you. A lot of people come and they won't let us do consults. And one of the things about mastery is you get a consult with both me and JP. And I can't tell you how many people pay this money and say, well, I'm not going to have my consult. Well, it's harder for us to help you when we don't know who you are. So I think we're going to make that a prerequisite this time that you absolutely have to do it. You have to do it within the first 30 days. So we'll keep you posted. But come to Vegas so you can be some of the First people to join if you like. So Rebecca follows a whole food plant-based diet. She says, my husband and I spent 10 days at True North Health Center last October, so we know the drill. Since I've been eating this way, my fingernails have developed vertical ridges and have started splitting vertically. One big toe, one big toenail became very thick and recently half of it split vertically and fell off. There is a new nail growing beneath it, so she expects the rest of the thick old part to fall off any time. What gives? A few years ago, I was eating a raw vegan diet as part of cancer treatment, and my nails became stronger than they've ever been in the seven weeks I spent at the treatment center. But that way of eating requires lots of nuts and coconut oil for satiety because I can't eat raw starches. I haven't found any real answers online. Do you know the answer? Well. Not a doctor, but first thing I want to say is how could seven weeks make your nails stronger? When nails grow, I believe it's something like three millimeters a month, like 0.12 inch a month. So, I mean, I'm not saying they didn't, but how do you know that it was that diet in seven weeks that did it, number one? Number two, the fact that you've already been to True North means that they have your medical records. So the best thing you could do is follow up with whoever your medical doctor was at True North. And if that person isn't there now or not available, all the medical doctors, all the natural pets do consults. I believe they're $95. That's what it was last time I had one with Dr. Clapper, who does his via Skype. My doctor is Dr. Sultana. He does his via phone. So I would have a consultation with not just a doctor, but with a True North medical doctor. You know, I heard a dermatologist speak, and I don't remember, I don't think they were plant-based, but one of the things they said for this condition is that a lot of times it's caused by doing dishes, or people that like that work with their hands a lot, painters, things like that. They recommend anytime you, if you wash your hands a lot, like nurses or doctors or dental hygienists, so a lot of that can cause this drying and splitting of the nails, so they recommend always wearing gloves. They say that when you cut your nails and file your nails, always do so wet. And you can hydrate your nails with oil. You don't have to put it in your mouth. You can put it on your nails. You know, they say it takes a whole year for your nail to go from here to here. That it's it's a long, it, nails grow really, really slowly. And one of the remedies I've heard recommended is something called Bag Bomb, which I think they might use on like on the udders. Or, I'm not sure what it is. They, they sell it at saddle feed stores, but it's called Bag Bomb. But the idea is, is you want to moisturize, whether it's your nails or your skin when it's wet. You don't want to moisturize dry, but I would try doing something topical first, but I would definitely, since you've already been to True North, you're in the system, just email them, get a consult, and, and, and that's what I would do because you're, I'm not saying that it's not your diet, but are you sure that it is? There's so many other factors, and cause doesn't always equal effect. 
because you ate one way for seven weeks. I mean, you can go back to eating that way. You know, you can do an experiment. Go back to eating that way for seven weeks and see if your nails improve, and then maybe you'll have an answer. But I would definitely talk to a True North doctor, and everybody can talk to a True North doctor, whether they've been to True North or not. And you can even often find a plant-based doctor in your area by going to www.vegdocs.com. Thank you for the question. Do you want to comment on her belief that um, nuts and coconut oil are required for satiety? So essentially, oh, the, she thinks you need not. to eat fat. Oh to my be God! Full. That's no, because they actually have weak satiety. You know, we talked about this today when I interviewed Dr. Alaguerra because people think they won't be satiated without fat. It's starch that makes you satiated. It's complex, unrefined carbohydrates. It's the potatoes, the squash, the sweet potatoes, the rice, the beans, all the whole grains and legumes. That is what creates satiety. If you look at the work of Dr. Susanna Holt, she created what's called the Satiety Index, the SI. And the food with the greatest satiety is the potato, people. It is not fat. Fat has weak satiety. If, as a matter of fact, of all three macronutrients, protein, fat, and carbohydrate, fat has the weakest satiety. Now, it does other things for you. It provides a lot of calories, and it provides more dopamine in the brain, so there's other reasons that you gravitate towards and like it, but it's not for satiety, trust me. So eat, a, eat, a, eat a bag of raw pistachios. That's about 3,200 calories. I've done it. I mean, eat a pound of it. I've done it. Like when I was at culinary school and I was at raw culinary school and I was so hungry because there was no starch, I could eat 3,200 calories of nuts and I could feel sick, but I sure wasn't satiated. Try eating this. You'll feel satiated. If you're not satiated, you're not eating enough starch. Fat will not satiate you. It'll just make you fat. Nice. So, would you please explain why you can, why a person cannot gain weight on fruits and vegetables? This whoever wrote in says, "I'm following the program, but eat at least two pounds of grapes, watching TV, and have gained five pounds." You said this wouldn't happen. <laughs> I don't remember saying that, but go ahead. Yes, I was at 110 for a year, then slowly put on weight. Now I'm 120. I do one hour aerobics, elliptical every day, and light weights two times a week. Why? Can I not lose the weight? Could the grains and potatoes cause the level, cause me to gain 10 pounds? Those are what was added to my diet. I think it would just happen gradually. Now my clothes don't fit. Okay. So, before I answer that, I want to go back to the nail question because I just realized there's other things that can cause nail splitting that I've heard from my clients other than just a low fat diet hypothyroidism and anemia. So make sure you're checked for that. Make sure you're checked in general. So you can't gain weight eating just fruits and vegetables. It is not possible. If you, if, if you, uh, now wait, there's a caveat. If the fruit you're eating is avocado, which is high in fat, 750 calories a pound, it is possible. But if you keep your calorie density to 300 calories per pound or less, which is all fruit except for avocado, that even includes the bananas, it doesn't include any dried fruit, but it includes all fresh fruit and all vegetables. It's impossible to gain weight. It is absolutely impossible to not lose weight with a calorie density that low. I believe even at 400, if I looked at, if I remember the work of Pritikin correctly, and it's been a while since I've read his book, even at a calorie density of 400 calories per pound, which would include things like the starchy fruits like the plantains and the winter squashes like Hubbard, acorn, kabocha, butternut, delicata, these still cannot gain weight. In fact, it's, it's not possible. It isn't. What I have said is if you keep, according to the research, if you keep your average calorie density per day to 567 calories per pound, which is almost everything to the left of the red line, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and most legumes, most people, listen to what I say, because I've said this a lot, can eat ad libitum, which is as much as you want, as often as you want, until comfortably full. If you are sitting on the couch eating two pounds of grapes after dinner, then I can't believe that you're not eating past comfortably full. Are you eating any SOS? Is there any sugar, oil, salt being added to your food? And it sounds to me like you're eating outside of hunger. Now, I, I think you didn't read all the question, Eden, because I remember her saying something to the effect of she, she, she said what she was eating, because I wrote her back and I said, what are you eating? And she said, she's not a member of the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, but she's following my program. Yes. And I can tell you, you're not following my program because your breakfast was, was fat, fruit, and grains. That was your breakfast, you told me. It was oatmeal, flaxseed, and fruit. That's yes. not in the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. The Ultimate Weight Loss Program 
we eat vegetables for breakfast. So right there, you're not following my program. My program has you eating the most calorically dilute foods food first, which is the raw salad. Then you eat a large serving of steamed vegetables or steamed greens or you know, a blended vegetable soup, if you like, but a hot soup with, with just vegetables. And then you move on to the satiated starches and maybe have some fruit for dessert. This is, uh, this is let's see, 40, 32. This is, this is uh, more than two pounds of cherries. So if you're eating this many grapes, I think you're eating past comfortably full, especially if you're eating it after dinner. So I, I saw very, very little vegetable material in the food journal that you sent me. I didn't see any vegetables for breakfast. I don't think I even saw any for lunch. So you're definitely not following my program. And as far as gaining weight, again, I would say have a session with one of the True North doctors. Have your thyroid checked. You know, as you age, sometimes our metabolism slows. We gain weight. There's lots of reasons. Uh, you know, you said your weight, but you didn't say how tall you are because maybe you're not overweight. I don't know. But if you eat past comfortably full, then yes, you can gain weight ostensibly, especially if you need to lose weight. You know, again, we have a couple people in ultimate weight loss that are gaining weight, but they came to the program anorexic. They need to gain weight. But if you stick to the left or the red line and eat to comfortably full, you it's very, very rare that a person would gain weight unless something is sneaking in. Okay, so here, these are OMG. You guys, you're gonna have the best dinner eating. Look at these, I'm gonna oh, put the yum. other two in. I'm so hungry. Oh my God, we can maybe not wait for Charles. That's <laughs> so mean. <laughs> so we should each get one big one and one little one. So I'm gonna cook the other two. Look at these guys. These are just crispy treats. Oh, you know what I forgot to do? And I'll what? do it on the next one. I forgot one thing, guys. Uh, this one got a little bit smushed. One of the things I forgot to do just to make it pretty is sprinkle some smoked paprika, which is different than regular paprika. Would that burn in the air fryer? No, no, it's gonna make it real pretty. So we're gonna cook these other two. Guys, this is the most delicious thing you can imagine. I'm gonna, this is why, you listen, you know, I wish Breville would give me one because I talk about them without even having it, but this is why you need one because otherwise you're gonna be here all day just cooking, you know, enough food for, you know, two people basically. So, there we go. Anything else for me? Oh, I wanted to say, there is a book now. I didn't have this book when I first got my air fryer. It's by my friend J.L. Field. She is a lovely, lovely gal with a radio show and many other books, a pressure cooking book. This is called The Vegan Air Fryer, The Healthier Way to Enjoy Deep Fried Flavors. If you're following Ultimate Weight Loss, just so you know, she uses sugar, oil, and salt. It's not a... There, there's nobody that doesn't, except for me and Kathy Fisher and Ramses Bravo, as far as I know. But but it does have a nice introduction and talks about the accessories, so that might be something you want to get. So, I have a question from Alice. Mm -hmm. She says, I've been doing McDougal since October of mm -hmm. 2016, but have been about 170-ish pounds and haven't lost or gained much since. I did lose 15 pounds in the beginning. Also, I've been watching everything whole food plant-based not including Weight Loss Wednesdays. I eat until the plate Not is including Weight Loss Wednesdays well, or included? It says WFPB, no including Weight Loss Wednesdays. So. I think she's watching Weight Loss Wednesdays. I don't know. Okay. You um, know we're not making up these questions because we can't even read them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe it was a typo. That's all right. I eat until the plate is clean. Almost daily, my stomach is painfully overfilled. I watch the kids eat, and I almost always leave something on their plate and can intuitively eat until they are full. Right. So, in the question lies the answer, like with the last question. If you eat into the pain, you're overeating. It doesn't matter what you're eating. So again, we always talk about this in the program, it's not what you're eating, what, what's eating you. You know, John Pierre has said for as long as I've known him, which is eight years now, until you deal with this, it's going to have a hard time dealing with this. Most people do not eat for hunger and survival anymore. We eat for all kinds of reasons. Anger, loneliness, sadness, depression, grief, anxiety, depression, or depression boredom. And if, food isn't the, if hunger's not the problem, food isn't the solution. So if you're eating into the pain, something's going on. Now, what's good is it sounds like you lost an initial 15 pounds, and because you're doing a McDougal-type program, you're not gaining weight, which is great, which proves my last point, that if you don't add oil to your food, you eat the high-fat foods, if you eat McDougal, you won't gain weight. Now, if you want to lose weight, 
then there's a couple things you do. You tighten the screws. Number one, you don't overeat. And to not overeat, you're going to have to learn some strategies. You're the one that's filling your plate. So if you eat until the plate is empty, then get a smaller plate. Or fill the plate less because you can always go back for more. You know, there's lots of reasons people overeat. I don't know how old you are, what your, uh, what your background is. You know, I have a friend who's almost 80 now who was three years old in the concentration camps during World War II. And he is not overweight, but he has lifestyle-related diseases from not being vegan, like he had to get the carotid arteries cleaned out. And he would come over, and like I, I would serve him something. Like he'd say he was hungry or whatever, I'd serve him something. Like, and so I would serve it to him, and he goes, I don't like this. And I'm like, okay, well, don't eat it. He would eat it anyway. His programming was because he was literally, he was starved the first three years of his life in the concentration camp. When he got food, he has to eat it. It didn't matter how it tasted. And now, 70 years later, he can't get over that programming. It's not, it didn't make him fat. I mean, he's choosing the wrong foods. But I, I said, I said, Alex, don't eat it if you don't like it. He goes, I can't, I can't not eat it. So the point I'm trying to make is there's, there is psychology involved with eating for most people. And a session with John Pierre might help you, a session with Dr. Doug Lyle. I mean, there's all kinds of strategies you can use from the book Mindless Eating by Brian Wansick, where, you know, like we have the food right here and we're gonna eat in the other room. So if people want more, they're gonna have to get up off their butt and come here and fill their plate. We're not gonna have a lazy Susan like at a Chinese restaurant spinning around where people can just see the food in front of them. So there's lots of tips and tricks, strategies you can use to eat less, but maybe you need to figure out why you're eating more. And as far as intuitive eating, yeah, you're right. Kids do that naturally, pets do that naturally. They don't, you know, uh, they don't eat into the pain. All animals in nature eat to satiation when they're given the right food. So my guess is because you are overweight, you have been eating the wrong food. Maybe you're not now, but you have in the past. And so, so there's a, I can't really answer the question in its entirety right then. But you said it's painful. So meaning you're overeating. And I think what happens with some people is they understand that oil is deleterious to their health and some of these other foods, and so they don't use these. And so, because it's much harder to medicate with food with a lower caloric density, because the more calorically concentrated the calories, the more dopamine is, is released. So of course we like chocolate and peanut butter and oil and, and cheese and all these sugar and flour better than kale and blueberries, because foods of a low caloric density produce way more dopamine. And so. What I've seen happen, I'm not saying this is you, Alice, is that some people really understand medically that they can't have these foods anymore and they've figured out that they're not going to, but they still want that dopamine that they got from these high fat, high calorie foods. And the only way they can get it is to overeat on the foods of a lower caloric density because the more you eat, the more dopamine you'll get. So my question is, is what else are you doing to feel good? How often are you having sex? How often are you exercising? How often are you meditating? So. If you want to feel good and you don't want it to be deleterious to your health or your figure, then you got to find other ways to feel good because food is really just one way, but it's socially acceptable, readily available, easily affordable, and that's what most people do. And it's never been more socially acceptable in human history to be overweight than ever before. So I, you're in the group, so let us help you. So Danielle has a really long question. Oh boy, they're um, all really long today. <laughs> She says, she thanks you for everything you do, and she says, I'm 15 pounds overweight. I eat a raw vegan lifestyle, very low in fat and high in carbohydrates. My averages, my ap my averages are of daily calories and always in range of 87 carbs, 87% carb, 7% protein, and 6% fat. I do not add any overt fat, so no avocados, olives, nuts, or seeds, and stick with fresh fruits, bananas, dates, loads of greens, carrots, bell peppers, tomatoes. My weight won't budge. I swim two times a week, do heavy weight training two times a week, and hot yoga at least four to six times a week. I drink plenty of water, get seven to nine hours of sleep each night with several naps throughout the week. I am on thyroid medication that is perfectly tuned in to me at the moment, so it's nothing medical. But I have a solid 15 pounds and probably actually 20 pounds to lose that will not move. I do overeat though, several times a week, I'd say maybe five times. I stuff myself till I feel sick. I do pretty good all day long, but once I get home, I eat nonstop until I go to bed and I lay there like a bloated tick. I can't stop. 
I eat a huge salad of sprouts, greens, shredded carrots, red bell peppers, and then make a pico de gallo out of mango, pineapple, tomato, cilantro, jalapeno, and pour over the top. Then I eat bananas or dates, and then later I'm back in the fridge and will eat another red bell pepper. I eat till I am sick and my stomach is bloated and uncomfortable. Um, but I repeat this almost every single evening. It's not because I didn't eat during the day. I s started the day with 32 ounces of water, then had a 32 ounce homemade green juice of all greens and lemon, then 32 ounce jar of melon, later some peaches, a huge salad like described above for lunch, then a large smoothie with five bananas, five dates, six huge handfuls of spinach and water. I'm full by the time I get home, but then I start eating more. I do not process starches like potatoes, rice, grains, beans at all. They sit in my stomach and cause major indigestion. At least with fruit and greens, it passes out We're of my have stomach. We're going to continue this question next hour. week just to get through the question. <laughs> it's, gonna, okay. it's about two Shorter sentences up. questions, guys, please. At least with fruit and greens, it passes out of my stomach within an hour, so I don't feel so full. Can you address those of us who are following yeah. a high-carb, low-fat vegan yeah. diet, 100% raw, so nothing processed, no overt fats, but yeah. still can't lose weight? Yeah, well, there's a couple things in there. And there uh, first of all, like the last question, if you're eating into the pain, you're, you're, some of it has to be, well, not necessarily, because I have some thoughts, but if it's not what I'm going to say next, if, you do, if you're, if you're, if you're making yourself sick with food, any kind of food, there generally is something emotional going on. And last, it's what my first thought is, is that you are just not satiated on the raw food diet because you don't have any starch. Now, I'm sorry, I don't believe that you cannot eat any cooked starches. Go to True North and they will teach you how. I'm not saying that you are don't have real digestive upsets, but I have never met anybody that couldn't eat some cooked winter squash or a sweet potato. I mean, it's true. There are people that can't handle the legume family. I've met them, and there are people that can't handle the grains. There's a lot of grains, though, that people that, quote, can't eat grains can eat, like the pseudo grains, like the amaranth, like, uh, not the amaranth, but like the, uh, the, the, um, the quinoa, for example, or the wild rice. But nobody has to eat grains. Nobody even has to eat legumes if they don't want to. But you have to eat some starch for satiation. And my thought is, is because you have no satiation in your diet whatsoever, no matter how many fruits and vegetables you eat, that you overeat on them because you're really trying to get satiated and you can't on fruits and vegetables. And I know there's some lovely people like Robbie Barbero that can eat a all raw diet and seem to thrive. But I haven't really found a woman who does, who can. We have menstrual cycles. We're completely different than men. And I'm sorry, no starch, no satiation. And I can't believe that you cannot eat a small amount of well-steamed butternut squash. I can't believe it. Or or pureed zucchini. And well, zucchini is a vegetable, but but like pureed squash, for example. And if you can't, then I think you should take the time to go to some doctor, especially a true north doctor, to figure out what is really wrong with your GI system to not be able to eat any starch. That does not make sense physiologically. We've been cooking our food longer than not cooking our food. There's a wonderful book on that by Raymond called Catching Fire. How it was when we started cooking our food that our brains became bigger and that we actually were able to um, uh, reproduce more as a species that all species even snakes who don't eat cooked food when offered cooked food over raw food will eat cooked food even if they don't naturally eat it because they understand the value in the caloric density so I think that's what's happening but the other thing is is that a few questions ago I said you can't gain weight due to calorie density eating fruits and vegetables you say you can't lose weight well you're eating dates so you're not in the ultimate weight loss program I know you said you might consider or somebody on today's question say they might consider joining for support. That's probably the best reason to join. But dates are very, very caloric. We don't use them on the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. I believe they are in three recipes where we're using like three of them to balance the acidity and savory recipes. But look at this. Dates are 40 to 60 calories each. Now these are the Deglet Nord. These are the Deglet Nord. These are 40 calories each. These are 10 Deglet Nord dates, 400 calories, 70% sugar, all the water's been removed, 1,300 calories a pound, more than six times as calorically dense as fresh food. It would be pretty easy to eat this many dates. For the same amount of calories in this many dates, 400 calories, you could have two of these, maybe, maybe even more. I'd have to do the math, but there's probably three of these for the same calories in these dates. This is why you're not satiated. Dates, bananas, no water, high sugar, for the same amount of calories in those berries. So that's what I think the problem is, is that you're eating too much sugar 
you're eating too many high sugar fruits like bananas and dates, you're not eating any starch, and you're starting your day with juice. And I'm sorry, juice is not satiating. You take the most important component out of the food, which is the pulp and the fiber, and you there's no satiety in that. I mean, I'm not saying that green juice can't be healing, they use it in True North for people medically supervised juice fast, but you're not getting any satiety. So I think it's gonna be really hard to lose weight the way you're eating right now. So I would really consider talking to one of the doctors at True North, figuring out why you really can't eat any starch. I've never heard of that, ever. And I think I need to write Dr. McDougall because that makes no sense physiologically. And uh, I think when you start eating some starch, you'll feel more satiated and you won't have to eat to the pain every night. And I don't recommend dates and I don't recommend bananas. I mean, not for everybody, but for you, you know, in all the food addiction programs outside the vegan world, which are all of them because we're the only vegan food addiction program, dates and bananas aren't even allowed because of the propensity to overheat and digest them. So get rid of the dates, get rid of the juice, and eat some starch. You need starch. The only thing that satisfies the hunger drive is complex carbohydrates. This is what is going to satiate you, satisfy you, and make you thin. And by the way, for those 400 calories and dates, we can eat all this corn. All right. And I also want to say, a lot of people who eat fully raw, their bodies become so accustomed to just fruits and veggies that once they start eating cooked starches again that are completely healthy, their body freaks out. And I think that sometimes it's also maybe psychosomatic that because you maybe feel guilt for eating cooked food or you think you shouldn't, then your mind kind of plays tricks on you when you start eating it more. So this two more, you guys. We are, and the great thing about the air fryer is when, when we're ready to eat, we'll just we'll just eat, we'll, you know we'll just pop these in again for a few minutes and eat some more. So any more questions, or do we get to eat now? We well, always walk Bailey before we eat, though. Eden always takes a walk with me after Weight Loss Wednesday. Huh. One more question. Okay. Um, Katharina, hopefully I pronounced that properly. Oh First God. of all, I want to thank you for your amazing work and spirit. You helped me so much. Can they smell these? These are awesome. Wow. Oh, my God. If you guys could. There'd be no. Those of you that are on the fence about an air fryer, if you could smell these, if you could taste these, there'd be no question. It's true. Yep. My question, she says, I lost 35 pounds in under two months. She went from 160 to 125 and I'm 5'4 and 30 years old. Followed, following your principles to the T, living a very active lifestyle, and by watching your episodes of Weight Loss Wednesday on YouTube over and over and over again. It makes me very happy but also scares the shit out of me because you mentioned that only slow weight loss is sustainable weight loss. I am afraid of yo-yoing back like I did on every other diet. I'm a volume eater like you are, eating up to 10 pounds of food every day, and I love my food. I don't want to lose this again. How can I be sure? Well, she must mean lose the weight loss. Mm -hmm. right. she, doesn't gain wanna, it she doesn't want to gain it back and have to lose right. it. Yeah. And how long will it take for me to accept that I am now slim for the rest of my life? I still have to check my body at every mirror walking by yeah. because I hardly can believe what happened in such a short amount of time. Huh. I'm making sure it isn't just a dream. I'm considering joining UWL just for the support of the group. Well, Sending much love from Austria. We would love to have you because she also sent me her picture and it, you're incredible looking. I mean, you're, you're af I mean, not that you were unattractive in your before, but the after picture is enough to inspire so many people. So I'd love for you to join just so we could post that picture. You said you lost 35 pounds in two months. That is really fast. That's 17 or eight, you know, 16 to 18 pounds a month. That That's more than four pounds a week. So, how did you do it? Because normally people lose up to two pounds a week, women, and up to three pounds a week, men. So that was really, really fast. So I'm curious how you were able to do that so quickly because you really weren't that, you were a little overweight, but you weren't obese, you weren't that overweight. So I didn't say that slow weight loss was the only chance to be successful. I just said that in general, slow weight loss is more sustainable. And again, as soon as that interview with Dr. Alvier comes out, it's going to make sense. And when I talk about these interviews I do, I have a show on YouTube called Healthy Living with Chef AJ. It's the same name as my television cooking show, so that could be confusing. And if you're on my mailing list, eatunprocessed.com, but if you're not, please sign up. We send these interviews out as they happen. The way you know you're on my mailing list is the last one we sent out was with this brilliant one with Doug Lyle about the ego trap versus the pleasure trap. If you don't have that in your inbox, you're probably not on my mailing list. Please consider signing up. 
and please consider sharing my Weight Loss Wednesday episode either right now using the share button or later on YouTube where it's posted within uh, 24 hours. So I didn't say that it's the only way, I just said it seems to be the most sustainable way because it has to do with all these hormones called ghrelin and leptin that turn on and off hunger signals and that when you lose weight very slowly, you don't get the signal that you're starving and that your brain doesn't pump out these, these hormones that are telling you, oh my God, we're losing strategic fat reserves we're starving, we better eat more. It, because it happens so slowly, it's like the brain doesn't even notice. Now, if you're familiar with my story from fat vegan to skinny bitch, and if you're not, take 47 minutes sometime to watch it on YouTube or Dr. McDougall's website. I have been this thin twice in my life, or this weight. Uh, the first time was in my teens when I was anorexic, and I got down to this weight in a very unhealthful manner by eating nothing, and it took about two months. I did it a second time at the age of 35 by Fen Fen. And again, it took about, a t about two months and I was eating, but I was eating crap, just less of it. It took me two and a half years to get to this weight this time. See, people only see the result. They don't realize that after the initial one pound a week weight loss for the first five months, 20 pounds, I lost about a quarter pound a week. But it, I wasn't in a race. This isn't a sprint. This is a marathon. And I wasn't really doing this for, I, I was doing it for weight loss because I wanted to avoid knee surgery and I needed to be leaner, the doctor said, to, to facilitate that goal. But I was doing this because when I understood what food addiction was, I wanted to recover from it and stabilize my brain. So I knew because how good I felt eating this weight without sugar, oil, flour, salt, chocolate, alcohol, high fat foods. I knew I was gonna eat this way the rest of my life because it made me feel so good. The weight loss was just a bonus. So the weight is generally a result of the food addiction, not the other way around. And so when you treat the food addiction and overcome the food addiction, the weight will naturally fall off. That was a very fast weight loss. So it doesn't mean you're gonna gain it back. The only way you'll gain the weight back is if you do something different than you're doing now. If you continue to eat the same way you did to lose these 35 pounds, you will not gain it back. The thing you have to be concerned about, not you, but everybody, is that did she say if she was exercising or not? I mean, from her body, well, the picture she sent me, it looks like she's very fit. But she says she's living a very active lifestyle. Okay, perfect. So here's the thing. So I'm bad at math, so we're just going to use round numbers. Let's just say that um, you weigh 200 pounds. Uh, and it's possible we have people that do weigh that, that now. I mean, the average weight for a female today is, is 166. That's like the average weight. So a lot of people do weigh 200 pounds. There's a concept known as basal metabolic rate. It's about 10 calories per pound. And of course, people are different. They have faster or slower metabolism. Some are hypothyroid, depending on how much you exercise. But everybody needs at least 10 calories per pound of body weight just for their resting metabolic rate, the RMR, to beat your heart, to breathe your lungs. If you were laying in a bed with a broken leg, you need at least 2,000 calories if you weigh 200 pounds. Of course, if you exercise, you, your caloric needs will go up. Now, if you get down to 120 pounds and lose 80 pounds, now at, 1200, at, at 120 pounds, your RMR, your resting metabolic rate, is 1,200 ca calories a day in the absence of exercise. 800 calories is a lot of food. I mean, I mean that's pretty much everything we have here. It's a lot of food. So if you're used to eating 2,000 calories a day and now you're eating 1,200, well, that's a lot less food. That's why we use the calorie density approach to weight loss, eating calorie dilute foods and sequencing them and eating them first. So now we can still eat large volumes of food, in many cases, more food, but you have to eat the right food and you have to eat it in, in sequential order. So if you do that, you'll be fine if you exercise, exercise is the only way you can safely raise your metabolism without drugs, you can have even more calories and then you can eat more food, but of the right food. You see, the thing that's so great about a low fat diet, the one that we follow in Ultimate Weight Loss, the one that Dr. McDougall and Dr. Esselstyn recommends, is that while you can lose weight on any dietary style, a low fat diet is the only one that actually allows you to eat to natural satiation. We talked about that earlier with the individual that thought the fat was making them satiated. No, not at all. It, satiation occurs from nutrients, from stretch, from the volume, and it, so it, it comes from the starch. So I wouldn't worry yet, but if you are worried, come to our group because a lot of people have the same concern as you. We call them the nouveau thin. I was fat for 52 years. I remember first being fat at the age of five, and the only reason I don't remember sooner is I don't have memories before the age of five. And so now it's been almost six years I've been in a lean body. 
and I'm pretty used to it. I know I'm thin, but it took a while because I think the brain, uh, many of us have what's called body dysmorphic syndrome, especially because I was anorexic, and so when I was thin, I thought I was fat. When I was fat, I thought I was thin, you know, whatever, I'm not sure. But, but the point is, as I think the brain is slower to catch up, but it will catch up eventually, and it, you look great, you are thin, you don't need to lose any more weight, you look amazing. How long it takes, I don't know. I would say for me, it like took about about two years, two years into being thin that I was like really, ah, yeah, yeah, I am thin. Because, um, you know, I, I can, I, I, I've lived in a thin body now long enough to know that I am thin, I'm operating as a thin person, I'm thinking like a thin person, I'm eating for hunger and survival instead of for emotional reasons. But it, it, you know, how long it takes, it's gonna depend. This is where a session with Doug Lyle, Dr. Doug Lyle, esteemdynamics.org could sometimes be useful. Two years after losing weight, I saw Dr. Goldhammer, Dr. Alan Goldhammer, my mentor, who is responsible along with Dr. Lyle and Dr. Goldhammer for making me a skinny bitch. And I said to him, because I always hear that 98% of people that gain, that lose weight, usually through a great deal of suffering and deprivation, gain it all back within two years. Sometimes the statistic says 95%, but the point is almost everybody that loses weight will gain it back, unfortunately. And that's because they go on a diet. See, the Ultimate Weight Loss Program, UWL, is ultimate way of life. It's ultimate warranty for life. And if you keep doing what you did to lose weight, you're not going to gain it back. But what most people do is they want fast weight loss. They're not really interested in, in changing their lifestyle or even health. So they want fast weight loss, which is what they get when they go to these weighing and measuring programs or the ketogenic diet, but it's completely unsustainable. And then they go off the program because they have cravings. They're not satiated. And... If you look at it as a diet, then, and that if you, if you felt deprived doing it, you probably will gain weight back. But if you do it in the way we recommend, where you eat all this delicious food as much as you want until comfortably full, you never feel like you're dieting. You feel like you're just eating nature's bounty and you're so happy and satisfied from all the starch and the sweetness from the fruit and, and the nutrients and the craving fighting ability of the vegetables that there's no reason to have a cheat day or go off plan because you never went on a diet in the first place. So the mistake people make, whether it's going on Weight Watchers or, or, or any program, is they're using it just to lose weight, not for the reasons we do it in Ultimate Weight Loss, which is to stabilize our brain chemistry and gain optimum health, because it's the same diet that F Dr. Esselstyn, who wrote the foreword to my book, uses for his patients. And so they use it to lose weight, and then they think, well, now that i lost weight, I'm going to add in stuff. And that is a disaster. I read sometimes on the boards about people saying, oh, well, you know, I'm almost at my goal weight. I'm going to add back avocado. Well... I believe it was Einstein who said you can't use the same mind that created a problem to find the solution. You can't use the same diet that made you fat and sick to make you lean and well. We know now by enough people who added nuts and seeds and dried fruit back into their diet in a very safe, measured way, like we're talking a minimal amount, like an ounce a day, who immediately gained 10% of their weight back. So for a, per a person that's 100 and and 40 pounds, that's seven pounds, like within weeks, within weeks. This will all become clear to you when you watch Dr. Olivier's interview where she talks about how somebody that has lost weight is metabolically very different than somebody that has never lost weight or somebody that um, is overweight and also has never lost weight or somebody that hasn't needed to, it's so different. And the bad, the, the, the bad news is, is for these people in UWL that gain 10% of their weight back immediately by reintroducing nuts or nuts and dried fruit, it took them forever to take it back off, like seven months to take off those seven pounds. So that's... Wouldn't the, it be 14 if it's 10% of 140? Oh, wait a minute. They gained 5% of their weight back. Oh, Sorry. okay. No, you're, you're right. So they, gained, they told me they gained 5% back. So for a 140-pound woman, they gained seven pounds back like that, and it took them seven months to take them off, just adding small amounts. So if you keep eating the way you're eating now, the way I taught you to eat in episode 36 or you know, you'll be fine. And there's always things we can do to tighten the screws, sequencing the meals. There, there's little tricks we can do, but I think you're gonna be fine. You look great and, and you seem like a great person. And I, I don't know if we have anybody from Austria, but we'd love to have you in the room. A lot so, of angry faces right now. I don't know oh, if they're no, upset that. I'm sorry, guys. So hope you're not angry at me because I showed you how to make this delicious recipe. We went over today, I apologize. We never go over with Kenny because Kenny's like, we gotta stop, we gotta stop and see. Eden is like, no, we can keep talking. So guys, thank you so much. Please share these videos. Please sign up for my website at edenprocess.com. Consider subscribing to my Facebook page, Chef AJ. If you're in Denver, I'll be there next week at Kelly 
Williamson's Plant-Based Summit on September 19th at Linda Middlesworth's Get Healthy Sacramento on August 20th and the 21st, 22nd, 23rd in True North giving a couple of lectures and a cooking demo. And there's still a few spaces left at the Ultimate Weight Loss Conference live in Las Vegas, September 1st, 2nd, 3rd. So I hope to see you there. And thank you so much for watching another episode of Weight Loss Wednesday. I'm Chef AJ and I truly believe you can have both the health and the body you so richly deserve. But you gotta eat starch.